happened if Louis the dog uh, Sam hi we're, we're here we're live yeah, yeah. hey it's Seth I'm here with Pete hey everybody hey, Pete Seth. is broken the record for the guest who has come the furthest to be on our Facebook live interaction yep. you came from where Schenectady New York <laughs> Albany yes all the way from Albany yes no no Melbourne Australia Melbourne yeah not as far as Perth but close no no not quite so we're here to talk about creativity we're here to talk about leveling up about the magic of the alt mba your work as a coach lots of things yeah right yeah so let me kick it off when did you um first show up at alt mba which one uh, i was alt mba 10 okay which was 12 months ago actually to the day i think um this time last year yeah and you were one of our australian pioneers we sort of pushed time zone boundaries <laughs> so that people in the middle of the night would be able to interact and now we have dozens of Australians. Yeah, yeah. So when I did it last year, we were, there was a bunch of us doing Pacific time zone, which was okay, but a little bit tiring, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, and now we have, yeah, we've got an Australian specific time zone, which is, which is good for all the people down in Asia Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. And along the way, after you, you so amazed us in Alt MBA 10 that we asked you to come on as a coach. Right, and yeah. you've coached how many times since then? All sessions, four sessions wow. since then. Wow, yeah. fantastic! Yeah, what's it like to be a coach? What do you do as a coach? Uh, it's a good question. I I love I love being a coach as part of the Alt MBA. Um, it's amazing in so many different facets, both to watch the students and to help the students leap and to grow and to experience a change as they go through the program, but also to work with Kelly and the team uh, is quite amazing. I think. There's about 40 of us now and we're sort of stationed all around the world yeah. and we all work remotely, which in itself is kind of amazing that that, that works. Um, so and then there are people like you who get on planes to visit <laughs> other people in Nashville. It's magical. Yes. Yeah, every now and then we come together as one and actually see what the rest of our bodies look like, which is <laughs> always kind of fun. One day someone's going to show up and they're just a head. Yeah, yeah. exactly. All right, so in addition to that, you have a day job. Mm -hmm. You're a creativity coach, but yeah. you do it in a way that's really fascinating. So before you tell us, just tell me how people find you. Yeah, so humanperiscope.com is actually my Human website. Periscope. Yeah, yes. I exactly. love that. Yeah. Easy to remember, not that hard to spell, yes. unique. Okay, humanperiscope.com. So tell us the kind of work you do and who you do it with. Yeah, so I ultimately, I enjoy helping people see things they cannot. Yeah. Which kind of lended, lended itself to the human periscope metaphor. Sure. I'm also six foot seven, so. Well, you're almost as tall as me. <laughs> Keep it up. Physically, it works as well. Uh -huh. uh, and I work with um, individually, one-on-one -on -one with a bunch of clients from around the world uh, to ultimately help them scale the vision of a particular change that they're working on. Uh, and that change is something that I think for them is obviously important in changing a corner of the world. And for me, is something that I buy into and I believe in. And so... But you do it a little differently. It's mostly asynchronous. Yes. So yes. What, how does that feel and what's that like? Yeah, so it's it feels... Uh, it feels alive, but not, if that well, it doesn't make sense. But um, what I mean by that is there's a, a, a Slack group that I create with each of my clients. And so um, I encourage them to blurt out as much and, and whenever as, as they want um, into that channel. Yep. And then obviously when I'm asleep and they're blurting, if they're in North America, then I can wake up, process that, give them some feedback, give them some ideas, ask them some questions. And then they have a little bit of time to think about that when they wake up as well. It's like the cobbler with the shoes overnight. Exactly. And part of, I'm guessing, never having seen it, but I'm guessing that there are times when someone at 10 a.m. New York time posts something, then 10.30, then 11, then 2, then 4, and by the time you look at it, they're done. They figure they it out. They solve their problem, yeah, yeah. which is great. It is. Everyone wins. Yeah, it's fascinating, actually. It, it, that, that happens where I'll, I'll get a question at yeah, 10 a.m., and then by 2 p.m., they're like, don't worry about it, Pete. I've got this. I've solved it. And it's like, okay. Yeah, so and I'll that, take that sounding board is really <laughs> priceless. And before we go to the questions... Um, <laughs> We were talking a little bit about the difference between the coached, the uncoached, and the slightly coached. Hmm. So the world is filled with some people who have figured out that coaching can make a difference in their life. It might be organized workshops like Alt MBA, mm -hmm. but it might be an ongoing relationship with something like Human Periscope. Yeah. Then there's the uncoached. These are people who are sure they need nothing, yes. no help. They don't want to say their thoughts out loud. Yeah. And in between are people who feel like maybe there's something possible, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. And that's who you're seeking, who we're seeking. Yeah. And it's magical because when you find someone who's ready to level up like that, yeah. and you can just be present 
Yeah. You can feel them getting taller and yeah. more generous. It's, yeah. it's really extraordinary. It is. And I think something that's important to highlight is it takes it takes like a quite a brave person to put their hand up and to say, I think I need help with this or I would love another perspective on this. And I think that, that group of people you mentioned that sort of think I've got this, that's sort of almost a way of, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily willing to share my work and be vulnerable enough to say, exactly. I need some help, uh, which we see a lot in the old MBA as well, obviously. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, a couple of housekeeping things. May I talk about the robot? Okay, so we've been running this robot for a few months. It never starts right at the beginning of a Facebook Live, so I always bring it up in the middle. Type the word start in the comments, just S-T-A-R-T, and you will get a little note from a Facebook robot every day until you tell it to stop. It's a prompt, it's a challenge, it's a link, and we've discovered people really like it. It's free, so you can give it a try. That's number one. Number two, Fraser, who uh, helps run our community, has uh, big plans to start a Medium channel, and that's going to go live really soon. So go ahead and put start in the comments, and we will alert you the minute it's ready. So that's the second thing. Third thing is in a minute, we're going to take your questions. So if you type a question into the comments, that's how we will hear it. And Sam, yes. you're, you're hiding behind the lights over there. <laughs> I know. So Sam got, Sam got new glasses, and they're very shiny. So we needed to put up a little barrier so that we're not blinded by the glare. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do questions now or do you want me to keep vamping and riffing? You can, you can dive in. You want to do questions yeah, now? Yeah, let's do a question. Okay. Why not? All right. So uh, this one is from Fraser. So um, I hear your brother, you referred your brother to the author MBA, Peter. Uh, I did. Uh, why did you think this was for him? Uh, thanks, Fraser, for that. Uh, I, when I first found out about the author MBA, actually, I, the first one of the first things I did was call my brother and said, I think I found it. I think I've got it. Uh, because I was kind of stuck and looking for an MBA or a, a way to kind of level myself up. And my brother at the time was doing a master's of entrepreneurship uh, at a business school in Melbourne. And I said, I think I found a better a better way. And he was in the middle of his master's, so he wasn't too, thrill he wasn't yeah. too thrilled to hear that. Uh, and like any big brother, he kind of pushed me and nudged me and gently said, why don't you give it a go? <laughs> you go first. You go first and let me know how it goes. And so I did. Uh, and I think him witnessing the change I went through as an individual, as an individual, and then uh, as part of joining the coaching community, it kind of got to, I think it was December uh, and January. So he took, took part in January and he sort of almost had no choice because he'd seen what I went through. Yeah, we well, called his bluff. Yeah, exactly. What's his name? Matt. Hey, Matt. He's from Perth, it. actually. Speaking of oh, Perth. Oh, he, he needed to come visit. You could you could break Pete's record. Yeah. Don't do it. That's a great question, Fraser. What else you got? Okay, so this one is from Jeremy. Um, what's your advice for getting unstuck? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, for getting unstuck. I think, personally, I, I like to do a couple of things. One is get out a blank notepad and start writing uh, based on the thing that you think you're stuck with and try and get some thoughts out there. Uh, and I think what often happens is that thing that you're stuck on becomes a little bit less scary when you write it down. Mm -hmm. The second thing I like to do uh, personally is then share that with someone else and say, this is what I think. This is where I think I'm stuck. What do you see? Like, what am I missing? And I think an external perspective, ideally even better if they don't really know what you're working on, uh, can be super beneficial. Um, I don't know what you think. So if stuck is the problem, truly the problem, then you're saying it's more important to get unstuck than it is to be right. Mm. The reason you're stuck is because you want to be right. So if you are willing to be wrong, then you're not stuck anymore because all you have to do is do something that's wrong. Yeah. And that is the most direct way to get unstuck is to do things that you don't think will work, mm. discover that you're correct that they don't work, and then do something else. And if you can continually do things that aren't going to work, you will soon find something that will. And your subconscious will get tired of doing things that aren't working. So it will find the guts to do the brave, emotionally intelligent, generous, uh, emotional labor that something that will work, right? Because most of the time we're stuck. A, we don't want to be wrong. And B, we don't want to do something that's hard or risky. So if you can suspend those things, you instantly get unstuck. But the last piece of it is, it might be that even you, if you have a really big keychain, there is no key that will open the lock. And maybe you just need to try a different door. That if you're stuck long enough in a relationship, in a situation, 
with a problem, it may be time to say, I am tilting at windmills. It's become a hobby. It's not productive. What's a different problem I ought to be solving? So I get stuck all the time, but when I'm stuck, I realize it's because I'm trying to be right. Huh. I love that. We're getting a lot of good questions. Go for it. Cool. We'll, um, we'll try to give shorter answers. <laughs> yeah. So this one is from Zach. Um, how do you help people that have too many projects and opportunities coming their way and are fearful of burnout? Okay, so I'll, I'll jump in on this yeah. one. There, there are two parts to that question. The reason you have too many projects is because you're afraid. And you, if you really care about making a difference, you will take every project you have except for one and put them in a folder and put the folder away. That the re Steve Pressfield has written about this so beautifully with resistance. The reason that people like us get distracted with, oh, I could do this and I could do this and I could do this, is not because we could do all those things because you can't do all of them. It's because that's safe. It's safe to say, I got one more thing to riff on. It's dangerous to say, I must do this one. And if that's what you want to do, make a difference, do it. And it turns out if you actually commit to making a difference, you're unlikely to burn out. Yeah, I would just echo what Seth said. All right, we'll keep going. The next one's for Pete. <laughs> um, so this one's for Sari. This one's for Peter. Um, what is the greatest tool or lesson you have adopted after completing the Alt MBA? Such a hard question to answer. Uh, I think the cool thing about the Alt MBA for me is, I think, and I hear you say this quite a bit, Seth, is once you see some of the things that you see in the Alt MBA, you can't unsee them. That it's not about learning a bunch of facts and figures that you regurgitate for a test and then walk out and never remember again. So I think to distill it to, to one particular thing, uh, for me, I think this idea of generously asking for and giving feedback to other people is really important and certainly something that I try and practice. You're good at this. Outside the... You're very good at that. At this? No, at like feedback. giving and getting feedback. Thank you. No, you're also good at Facebook Live, but I wouldn't say that during a Facebook Live. Yeah. The, the, fe the feedback thing, everyone says they're good at giving and getting feedback and no one is. <laughs> that you give someone direct feedback and they always start justifying themselves. Well, yeah, thank you, but, mm. and the reason I did that was, mm. uh, instead of doing what they need to do, which is to say thank you. Yeah. And that act just changes everything. Yeah. Because you stop trying to justify, you start listening. And the flip side is also true. Mm. That's a great one to bring up. Yeah. Okay, so this one's from Michelle, and it's three parts. Okay. okay. Three part. Yeah. Um, is it common to outgrow your coach? When it... Um, when it happens, what is the best conversation to have with them? And then how do you quickly level up to the next best coach? Ooh, love this question. Do you want to start? You can go if you want. Okay. I think uh, huh, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, the, so to take the first question, I think it was, when do you know you've outgrown your coach? Or yeah. is, it possible, you know? is it possible? Is it possible? I think totally it's possible. Yeah. Um, I think that everybody hopefully is going through a period of where they're trying to work on a change that's meaningful to them and that a coach is doing the same thing. And that if you think you're reaching a point where you're not necessarily getting the value that you want or you need out of that particular coach, I think it's, it's something that you should sit down and hopefully have an open conversation with them about that. You've helped me get to here. I now kind of want to go there. How can you help me get there? And if not, what should I do about it? Uh, and I think a good coach probably knows a bunch of other coaches who might be able to say, hey, I know this other person who might be able to help you go from there to there. Um, so I think it's a totally legitimate and fair thing to go through. And I can't yeah. really remember the second well, or third part. There, there are people in Romania who eat Romanian food every day. There are people in India who eat Indian food every day, all day. True. But we've discovered as the world has gotten tighter that switching the kind of food you eat is really interesting. And it opens up all sorts of taste bud opportunities yes. and uh, it's thrilling. I think it's hard to imagine why you wouldn't switch coaches yeah that switching coaches regularly not often but regularly forces you to have beginner's mind and mm -hmm. to learn a new way of being it's not if you have a coach that's offended when she or he hears that they're not a very good coach to begin with yeah. and i think that it certainly makes sense if you have a great coach to say for the next five months i'm going over there and i'll be back yeah because you don't need to constantly have new coaches but you certainly need to rotate the kind of emotion that you're bringing to the table as you push yourself forward. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It's something we talk about in the old NBA actually, just on that point is coaching yourself out of a job. Right. Of coaching someone to a point where they can coach themselves or they can go sure. and do the change they want to do. Exactly. Yeah. All right, this one's from Becca. What are you learning about yourself and others by being a coach? Great question. Thank you, Becca. Uh, I learn, I learn, it's funny. I think when you're a coach, your clients, if you're doing it well, get a lot of value out of the coaching that you give them. But if you're, if you're looking introspectively, I think you actually get a lot of value out of the interaction from them as well. So I, I find I get just as much from my interactions with my clients as they do from me. And I learn in particular about the benefit and the, the, the change that can happen when you hold space for someone in particular. Um, that if you can sit in silence, ask someone a probing question or, or a question and just kind of sit back and yep. listen, that you will, not only they will start to uncover and, and realize a bunch of things. And we talked about it earlier when they start solving their own problems in Slack. But as part of that, you can't help but internalize that and think to yourself, huh, how can I do a similar thing for myself? Exactly. And I think all good coaches have a coach themselves or a series of coaches. Um, you know, in the old MBA context, there's about 40 of us where we kind of help and support and grow each other. Uh, so that was sort of what I'd say to Ben. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. This has been a great session so far. Let me just remind people, type start mm -hmm. into the comments and we'll robot you. All right. This one is from Tracy. Um, what about when your gas tank is empty? You love your work and it's meaningful, but I'm running on empty. How do I get past that? So, you know what they say to people uh, who finish the marathon is... They finish the marathon, not you didn't get tired. Everyone who runs a marathon gets tired. The people who don't finish can't figure out where to put the tired. And the people who do finish have a place to put the tired. You don't go to a marathon coach and say, how can I run a marathon without getting tired? You learn what to do with that feeling. So in our industrialized economy, the challenge that we have is we spend most of our day either doing busy work, doing uh, work that has conflict in it, doing work that numbs us. And most of the time, if we're a creative, telling ourselves a story that wears us out. It's the story that wears us out. You're not going to find uh, a public speaker, a poet, uh, a singer, a writer who says, I can't type anymore because my fingers are tired. We don't stop because our fingers are tired. We stop because the voice in our head is overwhelming. So I think this feeling that you have of being on the edge of burnout. It's not going to be solved by a vacation or a two-week break. It's going to be solved by getting clear about where the tension lies within. What's the conflict and argument you're having with yourself over and over again? How do you get out of that cycle and stop catastrophizing? Because catastrophizing is exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, this is the last one. All right. uh, this is from Robert. How do you know when it's a good idea or time to outsource to a virtual assistant to free yourself up, sorry, to free yourself up for work on breaking through your own stuckness and take your business to the next level? Well, if you work on your own, you have a lousy boss and that would be you. Yes. And you, the boss, keeps assigning you to do jobs you shouldn't be doing. And you get assigned to do those jobs because the boss is too cheap to hire someone to do them instead of you. When you outsource this kind of work, you've raised the bar. And the reason you've raised the bar is now with that time you saved, you better be doing something of value, making a sale, creating an innovation, earning a deeper relationship. You can't hide behind the fact that you have to organize your receipts because someone else is organizing your receipts. So it's two halves. Half number one is the smart boss is trying to free you up to do productive, high value work. But half number two is if your boss does that for you, that would be you, you better be ready to dig in even deeper. So in my experience, I was a struggling freelancer for a really long time. I discovered that that busy work gave me a safe place to hide so that when I wasn't doing the busy work, I could be all in realizing I had to make something work. I think if I was doing it again, and if those services had been available 25 years ago, the smart thing would have been to outsource some of them and put myself even more on the spot. But I just want to be clear, don't do that if you're not ready. Because once you outsource it, you're on the hook. Yeah, 
I just would add, I just love that, that distinction of, or that, that frame of hiding behind work uh, that, you know, Cal Newport talks about deep work versus shallow work. And I think we can all get caught up hiding behind shallow work, which is responding to emails or getting into the minutiae of the thing that you're working on, which is important, but it's really important that you also carve out time and free yourself up to stand in front of a whiteboard for two hours and, yeah. and just see what comes. Um, I was telling a friend yesterday, I've answered 143,000 emails oh. personally in my career, <laughs> every one of which represented a moment I was hiding from the work <laughs> I should have been doing. So with that said, don't send me email and <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. Pete, thank, thank you. you for making this trip and for, for the me. amazing work you're doing of opening doors for people. Sam has something she wants to add. Um, the regular decision deadline. For oh, my seven. goodness. We've just had this whole thing and I never said it. I forgot. Oh, la, 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 la. Okay. okay. We're going we're gonna to put it in the comments, right in the description right underneath. But the clock is ticking day by day. Today is the very best day because what's today's date? I don't even know. The 17th. The 17th. So in just 10 or so days... That's it for the summer session. If you're in Australia, it's called winter. So it's even better. It we've, we've, we've got more Australians this time than ever because they're going to be able to come during the winter. But if you have air conditioning, the summer is fine too. The summer session is one of our favorites because people feel like they have a little bit more of a breather from work and we can go even deeper. So the summer session still has a few slots left. If you're interested in Alt MBA, this is the best time. It really is. Sam, thank you for all of this. If you have Thanks, questions uh, about AltMBA, sam at altmba.com is how to reach Sam. And there's plenty of stuff on the website. We just made a new video for you and some other things. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, everyone. Go make a ruckus, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Seth.